Hello, Earthlings. Welcome to First Contact Radio. Josh Poet with you here for another edition. Let's start things off with our cosmic weather for today. Starting off at spaceweather.com, our solar wind is currently blowing at 388.3 kilometers per second. Our planetary K index is currently at a 2, expected to be no higher than that the next 24 hours. And our chance for a flare of an M-class or X-class is down to only a 1% chance and very, very small chance, 5% that we're actually going to have some sort of geomagnetic storm down here on planet Earth. Now, if we take a look here, just any notices. It says that uh, sunspot AR 1402, the source of last week's X-flare and many beautiful auroras, is on the far side of the sun now. Although we can't see it, the active region is still erupting. During the late hours of January 31st, the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory observed this coronal mass ejection flying over the sun's western limb. So we can see it's still active, but not coming towards Earth. So that is a good thing for us down here. Now we've moved forward into another month, February. However, our sun sign stays the same, which is the sign of Aquarius. So for the next three weeks, we're going to be dealing with the Aquarian energy. Aquarian energy, remember, is it's a water sign. The symbol is the water bearer. Water deals with emotions, feelings, love. This month we have the, the celebration of Valentine's Day, which goes along with the idea of love and emotions, obviously. So these are the kind of ideas and things we have. We learn how to balance ourselves emotionally and mentally is one of the lessons also of the Aquarian. And then for our moon sign, we're in between signs today. Yesterday we were at a Taurus. Today we're in between Taurus and Gemini. So we're going from a earth sign to an air sign as far as mental, uh, unconsciously. So our subconscious is going to be looking at ways, thoughts, things are moving faster with the way we're thinking, ideas come to mind a little bit more over the course of today and tomorrow as the energies shift from earthly energies to air and energies. All right. And our current moon phase, we're 64% of the way there to a full moon. We should be there in just a couple of days. And last but not least, our dream spell for today is the beginning of a new wave spell. This is the yellow magnetic seed. So the yellow seed is the theme for this entire next 13 days of the wave spell. The seed is always is planting. You plant a seed, it grows, it becomes a flower, a plant, whatever it is that the seed is designed to be, it will be. So today called the yellow magnetic seed. Magnetic is the tone of attraction. It attracts everything to it. It starts off with a 1 and you're going to build to a 13. So the energy of today is all about magnetizing and attracting. This is actually the phrase right here. I unify in order to target attracting awareness. I seal the input of flowering with the magnetic tone of purpose. I am guided by my own power doubled. And on the Gregorian calendar it is Wednesday, February 1st, 2004. 12. So there you have it. You're all caught up to speed now. Dirk Bradshaw is with us here today, and he has a report on SOPA. So let's hear what Dirk has to say in this regards. I'll be back with UFO News in just a bit. Stay tuned. Dirk, over to you. Flying high above the planet Earth, this is the Cosmic News with Dirk Bradshaw. I am Dirk Bradshaw. When legislators in the U.S. abandoned their support of SOPA and PIPA in the wake of mass popular protest. Many of those who had been mobilized by the legislation, which would have granted the U.S. government almost total power to block access to foreign websites, accused so much as linking to copywritten material, did not have long to enjoy their victory. The very next day, the New Zealand police swooped into the million dollar estate of MegaUpload.com founder, Kim.com, arresting him and three others at the U.S. government's request for alleged racketeering, copyright infringement, and money laundering. The Department of Justice is now seeking the Mega Upload CEO's extradition 
to the U.S. This one I think we're going to call SOPA. Good God, what are you good for? Absolutely nothing. If you ask our leaders today, this is what they will say. I can neither confirm or deny. I can neither confirm or deny. I can neither confirm or deny. What's up with their lies? Some amongst those who have been campaigning against SOPA and PIPA did not know that the U.S. government already had the authority to shut down entire websites and, in fact, has exercised that authority on numerous occasions. What many are now learning is that far from some potential future threat, Internet censorship already exists in a variety of legislation that is already on the books in the United States and in nations around the world. In July of 2010, the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement seized the domain of eight websites that it accused of hosting illegal copies of copywritten material. As part of an investigation dubbed Operation in Our Sites, the seizures came before any trial took place, and six of the websites did not actually host any of the copywritten material in question only linking to it. In November, ICE acted once again, this time seizing 82 domains. Late last year, a number of nations signed a new global copyright agreement known as the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement, or ACTA. Signatories included the United States, Canada, Japan, Australia, South Korea, and recently 22 member states of the European Union. Reported to be a treaty against counterfeit goods, generic drugs, and copyright. It threatens to fundamentally alter the internet as it has existed so far. When situated in this context, the recent struggle over SOPA and PIPA bills are seen for what they really are. One battle in a much larger war for internet freedom and ultimately the cognitive liberty of the American public. But it is possible to win the battle and yet lose the war, as millions of mega uploader users who just had all of their files seized by the FBI found out the hard way. The only hope is that the movement that has arisen in the face of this, the greatest threat to the rise of the new era of mental independence, does not wane in the wake of the SOPA and the PIPA victory but instead rises to meet the even greater internet clampdown that awaits. After all, all the authorities are waiting for this public just to fall back. Well, I see the fat lady is getting off the stage. She's looking right at me. I've got to take her home and put her to bed. I hate goodbyes, so instead I'm going to say, until we meet again, I'm Dirk Bradshaw from the Cosmic News Network. I return you now to Joshua Poet in First Contact. They're all yours, Josh. This is the UFO News with Joshua Poet. All right, Dirk, thank you very much. This is the UFO News for today. I have five stories. The first one starts over at the UF, the examiner.com. Tracy Pierce, experts believe UFO New, New Jersey UFO could be from a parallel universe. According to a January 31st, 2012 report, a Montana hunter named William Puckett believes that several unidentified flying objects that appeared in the sky above Mawa Township in New Jersey may have originated from a parallel universe. AOL's patch quoted William Bucket, Puckett speaking about his views on the subject. My personal opinion is that UFOs that we can't explain are either something we are seeing from another dimension or a parallel universe, but not necessarily something extraterrestrial. The unidentified flying object in New Jersey that William Puckett is investigating were seen over the past year. Witnesses described the object as a diamond-shaped 
flickering in the sky. As UFO investigator, William Puckett has an impressive resume. He's a retired weather service meteorologist and environmental protection agency worker. He has been formally investigating UFO reports since 2003, and he created UFOs Northwest to further study the unidentified flying objects. Although some people may balk at the theory that unidentified flying objects could be from a parallel dimension, UFOs are by their very de definition unidentified and beyond explanation. Let's take a little compilation of his video here to see what he was seeing. All right, here we go. All right, this is now a nice little uh, compilation he has here of UFOs over the course of the years. It's eight minutes long, so it's not specific to this particular object that he was seeing. So it's a pretty good one. I was watching through it earlier, and check it out. See what you think there. It's on our page, UFO News. Now, next story comes to us from Antarctica of a UFO hovers over at a scientific lab. It's well known that UFOs use cloaking technology and that some use a cloak that makes them appear as clouds. Here we have another example of such over the German scientific building in Antarctica. This looks more like a UFO and nothing like a cloud. Let's take a look and see what this is all about here. This is from Antarctica Space Station. All right, there we go. That was the object in question. Okay, very interesting. Okay, well, I'm going to freeze it when it comes up again. All right, there's the object in question. Now, that doesn't really look like a cloud. Looks like a something that was trying to hide in the clouds, perhaps, but didn't do quite such a great job. All right, so this is over Antarctica. Pretty interesting indeed, and a good close-up shot of it. Not like any cloud that I have seen, and probably not like any cloud you have seen. And that's what they're seeing up there. All right, the next story comes to us from London, and this is a cell phone capture. Eyewitness states, I took the video with my mobile phone from a window about a year or two years ago. It shows some kind of shining object. All right. Take a look at this here. This is a little bit older, but nonetheless, you can see right there in the middle of the screen. It's very faint. Kind of catches the light sometimes. All right. Right there in the middle. Very good. Our next one comes to us from England again. Now, this is in regards to a chemtrail. Okay, so for some reason, orbs seem to be very curious about chemtrails. Perhaps they are taking measurements of the amount of pollutants that aircrafts are dumping into the atmosphere. All right, let's see here. There's the object in question. Okay, and there's the big old chemtrail. It's looking like, you silly humans, what are you doing? All right. And our last one comes to us from UFO Digest. Alien UFO, alien ET UFO community of Ascension Age 2012 and beyond. By Teresa Thurm. Sharing the alien ET UFO community guides into understanding avatars and Ascension Ascension Ascended Masters who receive ET visitations in 2012. We hope that these vague descriptions in the English language enlighten others who are traveling on the path that will lead to ascension of the extraterrestrial energy that our ancient ancestors passed down in various ways as oral traditions and that similar secret groups in Earth have tried to convey to their own members, love and light. There are numerous stories of old and ancient Sumerian texts of our ancient alien ancestors some appear as gods and goddesses, and others appear as the light beings we call ascended masters, and now E.T. or extraterrestrials and aliens. It is now time to lift the veil and make sense of all the ancient past history and that which we claim to understand among our secret societies and ancient world religions made for the humankind. The below is one description, and there are many prepared by others who are in the humanoid form that relate to that which some realize as their own thoughts and belief systems. 
Here below are a few which I have taken the liberty to enhance, so that the future may be easier to understand for all who are living in these amazing times of those who are visited by the light beings also known as the new higher beings and ET or extraterrestrials. May each being share in health and prosperity for all that remain on earth at this time and dispensation for those who will be wars and rumors of wars while we prepare those on earth to raise their enlightenment. Now we prepare for the way of those coming in the days in the golden dawn as mentioned by those of our ancient tribal ancestors as that of the ascension age to officially begin December 21st 2012 at 1111. Please read on before making a decision. Open your minds to what might appear as the ones who will come as the masters when the student is ready. The Ascension Center logos is that we will aspire to become the way we step down to speed of light this time and that which will come to be known by all in the future in quantum physics. The either can be frozen in time and the light can be seen in ways that others in science can share in words and in ways that all will someday see that their sages and seers and ascended masters were trying to convey in the love and light of that ascension. So it goes on much more. There's a very detailed article here. It's a good article. I would recommend that you read it. And I'm going to leave that up to you. Now just one note before we move on. In regards to the chemtrails versus the contrails, here's what you can do. If you go outside on any particular day when you see a plane flying, just take notice of the trail coming off of the plane. It'll be a trail that comes off, and then after a short period of time, it will dissipate rather quickly. However, you will see other things in the sky that come off the back of the planes, and instead of dissipating, they actually get wider and they will linger, sometimes for hours at a time. You will see them throughout the day, and this is the time when you start to see those crisscross patterns because there's usually more than one of them crossing the sky at that time. So that's how you can tell the difference. If they linger, it's some sort of chemical that is being sprayed into the sky either to be part of the Project Bluebeam effect or some chemical that's being sprayed over the population to test and see what it's doing. If it dissipates right after the plane goes by, it's the exhaust from the plane and there you have it. So that's how you can tell the difference. Just by paying attention to those things, you'll find that uh, you'll start asking more questions about why you're seeing things that you see. All right, there you have it. Time to jump away for a song. I'll be right back. Stay tuned. What if our government was responsible for some of the greatest crimes against this nation? Would you really want to know? These are big questions, but these questions deserve answers. It's time to demand the truth.
up, wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Patriots arise. It's time to demand the truth. All right, so continuing on here, first story up. The new poll shows that only Ron Paul or Romney can beat Obama. This comes to us out of InfoWars and Steve Watson. A new USA Today Gallup poll indicates that of the four remaining contenders for the GOP nomination, only Mitt Romney and Ron Paul are capable of challenging and defeating the incumbent president. According to the poll, Congressman Paul trails Obama by just three percentage points at 49 to 46. That is within the five-point margin of error and could easily be overturned if Paul were to win the nomination. The poll finds that Romney ties nationally with Obama in direct head-to-head, -head, with both receiving 48 percent. There's the poll right here. All right. Goes on to say, in contrast, Rick Santorum f trails Obama nationally by eight points. Well, Newt Gingrich lags even further behind with the 12-point deficit. The poll really clearly indicates that Gingrich and Santorum are polarizing figures and do not have the broad national electi electability that Romney and Paul have. Ron Paul has made the case that Florida debate last week that he is the best place candidate to go head-to-head -head with Obama in the general election. We have some pretty good evidence that I'll do quite well and have a better chance than the rest to beat him because if you do a national poll, I do very, very well against Obama. The congressman noted the latest poll adds even more weight to those from previous months that have showed similar trends. Now, of course, if you go to the mainstream media websites like Fox, you're not going to hear these same type of results because they don't want you to know these things. All right, we're going to jump over now to... Uh, this is Ron Paul's speech after the Florida primary, but I want to show you something first before we get into this. Remember how I mentioned to you the strangeness that goes on with YouTube and and their numbers? Well, here it says it's got 302 views. But look at this. 967 of those were likes, and four of those were dislikes. So that means there's been 971 viewers that have gone here and have been at this site and yet only three of 302 of them have viewed it you see what I mean about the numbers something's not right in this numbers 300 301 305 you'll see it come over and over again it's like that's where the somebody set the counter to stop and it seems to stop right there into 300 mark if you pay attention and watch that I'm telling you you'll see it over and over again someone is fudging the numbers there at YouTube Anyway, nonetheless, let's get over to this video and let's listen to what Dr. Paul has to say. Here we go. Speaking in Las Vegas right now, let's listen to him. Thank you, thank you. If enthusiasm wins election, we win hands down. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is great. This is very, very nice, and thank you very much for coming out. You know, just, just, just a little while ago, I called uh, Governor uh, Romney and congratulated him, and we had a friendly... No, we, we had... We, we had a friendly conversation, and uh, I, I, I honestly congratulate him. He ran a good campaign, but I also said I would see him soon in the caucus states. <laughs> you know, we've, we've been having a fantastic trip, and uh, not too long ago, a few days ago, we were up in Maine. Fantastic reception up in Maine. 
Today we had uh, three visits in Colorado, and they were fantastic. Uh, we've we visited with, and we probably had attendance well over 5,000 today in Colorado. And it looks like we have a few hundred here tonight, to say the least. A thousand people. <laughs> No, I, I uh, you know, a few months ago there were, well, how many candidates were there? were nine. We're down to four. But tonight, tonight I saw a statistic we're in third place when it comes to delegates, and that's what really counts. And we've only gotten started. Now the counting really occurred. Now, and we will spend our time in the caucus states because uh, if, if you have an irate Tyler's minority, you do very well in the caucus state. <laughs> but there's something else that the caucus states lends itself to. Because if you have an energized group of people that are working in a campaign and actually believe in something, it's better to work in the caucus states. This is what's been so fantastic with the campaign. I've been uh, doing a little bit of campaigning for Liberty for a long time. But l let, me, let me tell you, something big is happening in this country, and it's all very favorable. There's a mess up in Washington, and they've created a mess. They've given us a lousy foreign policy. They've given us a lousy budget, and they've given us a lousy recession. But where the wonderful thing is happening is in the grassroots. People are beginning to realize that the problem is too much government. We need more personal liberty. And this is where we're winning the hearts and minds of people, and the numbers are growing. I'll tell you what, there's many brush fires of freedom being lit across this country today. We don't even know where they are, there are so many. But it is being translated into great enthusiasm and change, the change that we need. We don't need to have more government, we need to get rid of some of the ordinary process of the government. We, uh, for instance, don't you think it's about time we had a new monetary policy? Yeah. In the Fed, right, in it. we have to invent something new, all we'd have to do is read the Constitution. They tell us exactly what we're supposed to have. Now, what about a foreign policy? We need a foreign policy, but do we have to invent it? No, all we have to do is read the Constitution. We need a strong national defense. We don't need to be the policemen of the world. And very very simply, we should reject and not get engaged in any more wars that aren't declared properly and supported by the people. You know, I've, I've gotten some advice on the internet every once in a while, and the advice is, Ron, if you would just change your foreign policy, you would get a few supporters. <laughs> If they only knew that the support for the freedom movement comes with a sound economic and a sound foreign policy that makes sense. Very simply, very simply it means bringing our troops home and stopping all these undeclared unwinnable wars. Now, what would, this, what would this do for our economy? I'd like to see all the troops spending their money here at home and not going over there. But in the last 10 years, fighting these unwinnable, undeclared wars, we have spent over $4 trillion more into debt for this. 
So there's a cost of life and limb, but there's an economic cost as well, and the American people are tired of it, and they're ready because they know this country is bankrupt. All great nations go down because they overextend themselves overseas. So I would say it's time for us to wake up. Don't wait for an economic crisis to hit when we have to come wimping home. We ought to just wise up, spend our money wisely, defend this country, and don't pretend that we can tell other people how to live. The greatest, the greatest danger when we accept the notion that the government's supposed to take care of us from cradle to grave and we're supposed to be the policemen of the world is that ultimately is done at the expense of personal liberty. The purpose of all governments should be the protection of individual liberty for each and every one of them. We need to reverse the trend on the attack on our civil liberties. We need to repeal the Patriot Act. We need to repeal... We need to repeal the provision that the president has the authority to assassinate American citizens without trial. We need to repeal the provision that says the president can use the military to arrest any American citizen and deny them a trial. Very simply, the answer is send only people to Washington, send only people to the White House that know and understand and read the Constitution and enforce the Constitution. And then there would be, then we would have the full understanding how you have a peaceful, thriving nation as you enforce the concept of liberty. Enforce the liberty for each and every one of us equally. This brings people together because people will use their liberty in different manners, but we don't have to fight over how they use their liberty as long as they assume responsibility for themselves and the consequences of all their actions. It also... It also very simply suggests the fact that if we have a right to our life and our liberty, we should have a right to keep the fruits of our labor as well. So we don't have to reinvent something. We can improve on our past, but we had a great past. We had a great constitution. We had a great uh, middle class, the richest and the biggest middle class ever. And we've undermined it with excessive spending, excessive taxation, a monetary system that is flawed and a foreign policy is flawed. So all we have to do is return to our roots. And in a short time, we could have our peace and our prosperity and our reliance on ourselves with our personal liberty. Not only has this been a great day for the campaign for liberty and, the, and this process, but it's been a great week for the campaign. And believe me, it's been a great past four years because five, six, or seven years ago, they really didn't know exactly what was happening. But with the crisis that hit, both the economic crisis that we had four years ago, the realization of the significance of our Federal Reserve System, as well as our flawed foreign policy, the people know about it. They're awakening to this. They're listening to this message. It's up to us to do something about it. The message is loud and clear. The enthusiasm is here, but it has to be translated into proper political action. That means attending the caucuses and send a powerful message to this country that we want our freedoms back. We don't want more government. Thank you very much. Ron Paul, the Texas Congress. All right, very good. So good response from Ron Paul over at the after the primary. Okay, now continuing on, let's listen to what's going on with Obama. We know about what took place in Georgia. Now he's got another situation, and that is with Illinois. 
Illinois Board of Elections to hear Obama eligibility case February 2nd. That would be tomorrow. Public notice, State Board of Elections and State Officers Electorals Board meeting. The Illinois State Board of Elections will conduct a special board meeting on Thursday, February 2nd, 2012. The meeting is scheduled to begin at 11 a.m. in the board's con conference room 14 to 100 in the James R. Thompson Center, 100 Randolph Street, Chicago, and via video conference on the board's principal office located at 1020 South Spring Street, Springfield, Illinois. Admittance to the 14th floor of the Thompson Center requires security screening and production of a government-issued identification. The State Board of Elections will convene to consider the candidate withdrawal of Alan Nudo, 52nd uh, Senate District, following certification. Let's see here. Where's it going? The State... Uh, the State Office Board Elections will also consider the following objections to candidate nomination petitions to the February to the March 20th primary election. And it goes on to say February 2nd hearing on whether Illinois State Board of Elections will allow Barack Obama on the Illinois presidential ballot even though he is not a natural born citizen according to Supreme Court precedent Minor versus Happersat. Hearings are open to the public. Please attend to support the objectors if you can. So here we got something going on. Remember, Obama is not a natural born citizen. A natural born citizen means you have two parents that are both American citizens. His were not. His father was from Kenya. Therefore, he does not have two parents that are natural born citizens. Now the next story here continues on with Obama. Green light to see Obama's files. An attorney who presented evidence to Georgia's judge last week on Barack Obama's eligibility for the state's 2012 presidential ballot believes she now has the right to demand to see the original Hawaii documents. Obama last April released what he said was a copy of his original Hawaii birth certificate, but a number of imaging document and computer experts contended is a fraud. The original birth cert documentation could undermine Obama's claim to be a natural-born citizen as the Constitution requires. Many of his critics, however, say the birth documentation doesn't matter because Obama's father was never a U.S. citizen. The founders likely understood natural-born citizen to mean offspring of two U.S. citizens. Now, California attorney Orly Tate, who has brought a number of major ch legal challenges to Obama's eligibility in various courts up to the U.S. Supreme Court, has told WND that when Obama and his lawyer wrote a letter to Georgia Secretary of State Brian Kemp last week, Refusing to attend the hearing on Obama's eligibility status, they included a copy of the image that the White House released last April. They also sent a copy to the court of Judge Michael Molly, the hearing office, officer whose ruling is expected to be made available the next few days. That act, Tate expla explained, effectively gave the court a copy of the White House documentation, and under ordinary rules, the evidence of opposing side is supposed to have access to the original to verify the authenticity of the purported copy. They submitted a copy and said that this is a copy of the original birth certificate. Now the other party has a right to examine the original, she said. Her next step was to ask Molly for the letter for the courts in Hawaii seeking a subpoena for the records. When the judge responded that the issue probably was outside his jurisdiction as an administrative law judge, she received permission to take her subject to Fulton County Superior Court. An email Tate's posted online showed that the court in Georgia carried permission from Molly to feel free to petition the Superior Court if you so choose. The birth certificate issue has plagued Obama since the 2008 election. When concerns arose at his eligibility, his campaign posted an image of his abbreviated birth certificate called a certification of live birth. At that time, his campaign stated that this was the only document available from the state of Hawaii documenting births, even though other people were able to obtain long-form documents. It was when the first hardcover edition of Where's Your Birth Certificate by Jerome Corsi was about to be released that Obama dispatched one of his private attorneys to Hawaii to fetch other document image, this time a long-form certificate of live birth. Many experts have concluded it likely was a computer-generated document, not a copy of an original 1961 document. Tate told WND that a request to the Superior Court will ask the Hawaii court system to issue a subpoena for the original documentation so she can examine it and compare it to the White House representation.
I have a green light to proceed, she said. All right, and here is a copy of the fake that was put up. And you can tell it's a fake. I mean, just look at this thing here. All right, and this article goes on and on and on. All right, very good. So we see things are progressing there. Hopefully, we're going to see the liar found out to be the liar that he is, maybe put behind bars, or maybe even deported from this country. That would be something, wouldn't it? All right, moving right along, the mainstream media, as you know, likes to, well, it likes to lie. And it likes to portray politicians that lie as being the best thing that we need for this country. Here is a story from RT and Tom Hartman talking directly on this issue. Here we go. There's one industry, just one industry, that's specifically mentioned in the United States Constitution, and that's the press. That's because the founders knew how important a free, open, and diligent press is to keeping a too powerful government in check and for a population to be informed enough to make a reasonable democratic vote. As Thomas Jefferson said, we're left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government. I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. That's how crucial the press is to our form of government. That's especially true during an election year when politicians will throw whatever little lie they can at the wall, hoping that a few of them will stick to sway voters. It's up to the press to make sure that none of those lies stick. Unfortunately, today the press is dropping the ball. For example, on Sunday's State of the Union morning show on CNN, Republican Senate Minority Leader Rich, Mitch McConnell told this whopper of a lie to Candy Crowley. They've been trying to pretend like the president just showed up yesterday just got sworn in and was starting fresh. In fact, he's been in office three years. He got everything he wanted from a completely compliant Congress for two of those three years. Really? A completely compliant Congress for two of those three years? Really? Then why is it that Mitch McConnell himself led his Republican minority in the Senate to shatter the record for the most filibusters in one session of Congress, a record that goes all the way back to the George Washington administration? Obama didn't get everything he wanted from Congress. Far from it. From the very beginning, he had to negotiate down his stimulus package and make a full third of it tax cuts just to get three Republicans, Susan Collins, Olympia Snow, and Arlen Specter, on board with it. And when it came to health care, did President Obama really get everything he wanted from Congress? He didn't get a public option, and he sure as heck didn't get the Cornhusker kickback, or didn't want, rather, the Cornhusker kickback that so-called Democratic Senator Ben Nelson demanded or the Louisiana Purchase that so-called Democratic Senator Mary Landrieu asked for in return for her support, yet that's exactly what Congress gave him. He didn't get cap-and-trade energy le reform legislation through the Senate, as he wanted, because he couldn't overcome a unanimous Republican filibuster. He couldn't get the Disclose Act, requiring full disclosure of who's spending how much money in our elections post-Citizens United, because it, too, couldn't break a unanimous fil Republican filibuster. He couldn't get comprehensive immigration reform, and legislation like the DREAM Act passed, again, thanks to a unanimous McConnell-led Republican filibuster in the Senate. And he couldn't get legislation through the Senate to end tax breaks for corporations that outsource American jobs, a bill named Creating American Jobs and Ending Offshoring Act. All of these bills I just mentioned passed the House, had more than 50 percent of the vote in the Senate, but couldn't break Mitch McConnell's unanimous Republican filibuster, which set the bar at 60 percent rather than a simple majority. And all of these bills would have yielded tremendous benefits for our nation. They would have put jobless Americans back to work. They would have provided health insurance for 53 million uninsured Americans. They put a, would have put our nation on track toward clean energy. They would have strengthened our democracy and fixed a broken immigration system. So what the hell is Mitch McConnell talking about when he says that Congress gave the president everything he wanted in those first two years? He's lying. It's a complete and utter lie. And it's up to Candy Crowley to call him out on it. He got everything he wanted from a completely compliant Congress for two of those three years. You don't hear him mention any of that. So what he's been engaged in since the bus tours began last August is try to convince the American people that somebody else is standing in his way. But He's doesn't that seem to be working? Well, doesn't it seem to be working? Are you serious? So after McConnell just lied to her face, 
Crowley takes the bait, accepts the lie, and then asks if President Obama's strategy to rewrite history as asserted by McConnell is working? That's not journalism, it's stenography. Not challenging the assertion that Congress gave President Obama everything he wanted is like agreeing that President Bush had reliable intelligence that Saddam Hussein was making nukes and chemical weapons. Both couldn't be further from the truth. Yet both echoed across the airwaves on the mainstream news to the point that most Republicans and a few independents and Democrats believe them to this day. In defense of Candy Crowley, this is nothing unique to her or her show. Meet the press, face the nation, every single show on Fox News, you name it. And you'll find Republicans and occasionally Democrats flat out lying to journalism school graduates who don't blink and don't call them on their lies. And why don't they call out lies? Because they're afraid the big name politicians will refuse to come on their shows in the future. And those shows are set up in such a way that if they don't get the big names, the show goes down in flames. It's called needing access. And it's why networks pressure good journalists to let a few lies slide. This is why the mainstream media has such a bad reputation today. They've given up their job that Jefferson envisioned of adversarial, keep them honest journalism, and handed the role of fact-checking off to political talking heads who often have no interest in the facts at all, especially during an election year. And since they've dropped the ball, others have had to pick it up, like Julian Assange at WikiLeaks. He's not an outlaw. He's a journalist who's doing the job that the mainstream media should be doing, speaking truth to power and giving people the facts to make informed decisions. And there are other independent media outlets doing the same thing, like Democracy Now!, Free Speech TV, Current TV, independent websites like Democratic Underground, Truth Out, BuzzFlash, Op-Ed News, Common Dreams, Raw Story, and Alternate, among others. It's time to turn the mainstream TV off and turn on those who are reporting news in the same spirit Thomas Jefferson envisioned. Our democratic republic will be the better as a result. Okay, you know, I often wonder as I'm watching the news and, you know, do the, pol do the uh, reporters that are on Fox or CNN or MSNBC or CBS, do any of them actually look at any news other than their own news? Do they? Do they turn on the internet? Do they go and do they read any of the stories? Because it's not like it's a difficult thing to find out really what's going on in the world. It just requires an effort to go down, turn on a computer, and just do a little searching. So I don't understand why, unless, of course, that these reporters are just so afraid for their jobs that they're willing to lie like they're doing. I don't know. It doesn't make sense. Now, here's a story that... Uh, certainly makes no sense at all because this is the FBI raids wrong apartment in Fitchburg, Massachusetts. All right, and this little girl was unfortunately the victim of this. An FBI raid called Operation Red Wolf has the agency slightly red-faced. A two-year investigation into drugs and weapons led them to the second floor of a building in Massachusetts, but to the wrong apartment. I took two steps, faced the second door, and I heard a click of a gun and saying, FBI, get down. So I laid down on my living room floor, said Judy Sanchez. Sanchez described how she was terrorized during an early morning FBI raid in Fitchburg. I was screaming, you have the wrong apartment, you have the wrong apartment, over 50 times, and I see the big blade coming down my door, she said. The feds chainsawed their way into her second floor apartment before realizing they had the wrong spot. Their suspect was next door, and they eventually got him, but not before humiliating Sanchez, scaring the daylights out of her three-year-old daughter, Johnny, who was left alone and screaming in another room. I was 35 minutes just holding my puppy. She was just shaking as much as, it, as I was. It was very cold. Doors were open, and they didn't let me get my jacket or even as much get my daughter. It was horrible, said Sanchez. The FBI said the agent repeatedly apologized for a mistake and Sanchez was reimbursed for the broken door, but it was hardly enough to appease her anger to lessen her fear. She's taken to sleeping with a baseball bat ever since the raid and her daughter continues acting out. Anytime anyone knocks, she freezes up. A two-year investigation and you still knock on the wrong door? That's crazy, said Sanchez. As for the real suspect, Luis Vasquez faces up to 40 years in prison if he's convicted. Two years! The FBI, in their wise intelligence, took two years and investigated and still got the wrong address. Maybe they're not so smart as they think they are. You know, folks, maybe we need to 
pay more attention to these agencies because they're just corrupt. They're just filled with apparently incompetent individuals. Because how many people do you think were on that case for two years investigating, and yet they got the wrong address? Someone's incompetent. Somebody needs to answer for this because there's no reason this should be happening. But unfortunately, it is. U.S. Intel director prepares public for false flag event. This comes for us from Coney, Tony Cartolucci over at Infowars.com. It would be far more preferable if the United States could cite an Iranian provocation as justification for the airstrikes before launching them. Clearly, the more outrageous, the more deadly, and the more unprovoked the Iranian action, the better off the United States would be. Of course, it would be very difficult for the United States to go at Iran into such a provocation without the rest of the world recognizing this game, which would then undermine it. One method would be to have the same possibility of success would be to ratchet up covert regime change efforts in the hope that Tehran would retaliate overtly or even semi-overtly, which could then be portrayed as an unprovoked act of Iranian aggression. U.S. foreign policymakers and Fortune 500 funded group Brookings Institutions um, which path to Persia? There's a report there for you to read. And then consider, considering the Gulf of Tonkin incident was a deliberate fabrication to escalate the Vietnam War. One of the members of Congress are shown to have acknowledged and debated even at that time. Or the more recent Iraqi WMD hoax, which there is certainly a historical precedent to create such provocations when targeted nations refuse to provide them. With this in mind, and nothing... And noting an, an overt ongoing series of bold acts of war carried out by the U.S. and Israel inside of Iran, along with sanctions and planned blockades, also acts of war, the corporate financier oligarchs have been confounded by what seems to be the infinite Iranian patience to endure such provocations. U.S. foreign policymakers have noted for years now that Iran is actually, in actuality, possesses no threat to the U.S. or Israeli national security and their acquiring a nuclear weapon serves more of a deterrence against future military incursions against the Islamic Republic by the West than a means to launch unprovoked attacks against nations that each possess nuclear deterrence of apocalyptic scale. Now you can go on and on, but as you could see, it's leading up to the idea of a false flag event taking place in this country. Now we've had plenty of false flags before, as the article talks about, Gulf of Tonkin being one of them. More recently, 9-11. Now, if this day and age, if you don't understand that 9-11 was a false flag event, then you're still in some sort of denial or delusion. So you need to get with the program. The research is overwhelming. It's been done by some of the top scientists and researchers and architects and engineers and, and you know people that can look at this stuff. It's available. All you have to do is go on and look. Just Google 9-11 Truth. Start right there. 9-11 was a false flag. They'll do another false flag. And the reason they keep doing these false flags is because they believe people aren't catching on to the fact that they are doing false flags. So if you think of all the people, every time you mention 9-11 was a false flag, that have told you no, well, these are the same people that are going to be fooled if they pull another false flag. So are we supposed to live our lives according to all of the brain-dead, brainwashed individuals in the country who are fooled by all the false flags? Are we supposed to listen to those who have their eyes open saying, this is a false flag, don't believe it? That seems to be more sensible because the ones that are brainwashed and brain-dead, they're only spouting what the government tells them, what the media tells them. And with a quick fact check online, you can find out that the lies are thick and heavy coming from the mainstream media. So you can't believe them. So you need to decide, you need to draw your line in the sand, my friends. Which way are you going to go? Are you going to be an establishment believer and believe every lie that they tell you? Or are you going to actually want to know what's going on in the world so that you don't run into a situation where your rights are trampled on and you are unaware of it? It's very easy because if you don't know what rights you're losing, then you don't really care and you don't know if you've lost them. And many people are having that exact same thing happen. All right, so I'm going to move on now, close things off with our meditation for today. Just go ahead and close your eyes, everybody. Close your eyes 
and relax. All right. For today's meditation, let us imagine. Let us imagine that we are in the middle of a large field. And we're looking up at the sky and it's nighttime. And as we look up and we see we see hundreds, thousands and thousands of stars shining bright. We see the moon and we see the lights from the other planets that periodically come into view. And as we recognize and look at all of these stars and all of these lights in the sky, it helps us to understand a bit more of our place in the universe. It also humbles us to realize how large the universe is. Take a moment to consider the problems that are going on in your life right now. And consider how small those problems are to others who are on other planets. Or how small the problems of others on other planets are to you down here. It's a large, large, large universe and there's lots of life. And there's lots of individuals with problems but there are also lots of solutions. And as we look at the light shining from above, it gives us hope that even in the darkest darkness of space, there is still light shining. And as we recognize the light and the darkness, we're able to allow that light to shine brighter in our lives to dissipate the darkness and the confusion around us. So imagine, imagine this starlight shining down and as it does, imagine your body absorbing this light. And as it absorbs this starlight, there's enough for everybody around the planet. As your body absorbs this starlight, notice that the light in your body fills, becomes brighter and the darkness dissipates. And as the darkness dissipates, feel that the fears dissipate along with it. The worries and the doubts dissipate along with it. And in the light, you see things clearly. And as you see things clearly, your decisions are better. And as your decisions are better, your interactions with others become better. And there's a chain reaction and everything changes and becomes better simply by clarity. And as each individual on this planet becomes clear and focused, we all become clearer and more focused. For we are all part of the same family, all children of the great creator. Let's imagine all of our chakras are activated right down the middle of the spine. There's seven of them starting at the bottom of your spine. Imagine the color red. This is the root chakra and it draws the energy from the earth. And then let the energy raise up higher right up the middle of the body just to the belly button area there imagine the color orange this is the chakra that deals with the emotional body and then let the energy raise up higher just below the rib cage imagine the color yellow the chakra deals with the intellectual body let the energy raise up higher to the heart right in the middle of the heart imagine the color green this is the chakra of love then let the energy raise up higher to the throat imagine the color blue this is our communication chakra the center of how we express ourselves let the energy raise up higher right between the 
two eyebrows to the third eye and imagine the color violet. And then finally to the top of your head, imagine the color indigo and the light continues on up into the cosmos. You got all this multicolored light flowing through you. Allow it to overflow. Spilling out into the room. You notice the line of light around your body, this line of protection that forms and is part of your spiritual armor. And let's think a good thought in the, for everyone in the world. And let's imagine from our heart chakra, we send out love. We send out light and love to everyone around the world. And let's slowly bring our energy and attention back to the present moment on the count of three. Three, coming back to the present moment filled with confidence. Two, coming back to the present moment filled with faith. And one, coming back to the present moment happy, healthy, and whole. Happy, healthy, and whole. All right, there you have it. Another show, another prayer, another meditation. Thanks for being here again. We're moving right along in this year. A new month has begun. Let's, uh, let's go forth. Let's have a good month. So have a good day and just, uh, you know, keep thinking good thoughts for everybody. Remember, we're all in this together. We're all going to make it through. We just have to keep believing. That's it, my friends. Keep believing. I'll be back tomorrow. Dirk will be here with another story. Till then, be safe. Peace. I'm out of here.